So we soak up the word of God. A burden is formed in us. A storm is formed in us. And then we move inland there to send forth of our burden. So laden with the word of God, moved by the spirit of God. We are a storm of holy passion and righteous truth. Well, hey, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast, episode 325. I'm your host, Mike Neglia. And the voice of this week's guest is Pastor Tim Brown. And what you're going to hear is one of the freshest takes on sermon prep and delivery that I've ever heard. Uh, And this is the sort of thing that I'm actually obsessed with. I think about sermon prep all the time. I read about it. I listen to it. I get to travel the world through Expositors Collective. And we've put on like more than a dozen training events about sermon prep. And when I listened to this message online a few months ago, it was almost jaw dropping. So I don't want to give away too much because you're going to hear it for yourself in a few moments. But I know that this is going to be a fresh take on the art and the craft of sermon prep and delivery. Uh, Tim Brown's been in ministry since 1972, and he's got some great accumulated wisdom to share. If you wanna hear more from Tim Brown and learn from him, well then you're in luck because he's gonna be one of our main session speakers at our next training event, which is coming soon to the San Francisco Bay Area in the Tri-Valley region, a town called Pleasanton. And you'll get a chance to learn from Tim directly as he shares from the front. And also he's going to be one of our group leaders and coaches. So now there's one more reason for you to come along, bring your team and join us in Pleasanton, California, May 24th and 25th. Uh, Here's an invitation from Pastor Heath Hardesty Hey everyone, Heath Hardesty here, pastor of Valley Community Church in Pleasanton, California. I wanna invite you to come out on May 24th and 25th to the Expositors Collective Interactive Training Event here in the beautiful Bay Area. This will help you grow in your personal study and the public proclamation of God's word. This will be a joyful time where we learn new skills and we do it in community all for the glory of God. So bring your team, uh, come on out. It'll be a powerful time of learning how to preach God's word in a joyful and powerful way. We hope to see you then. This is the audio recording of a message given at a Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference in Northern California on the 7th of September, 2024. And big thanks to Regeneration Church, for allowing us to rebroadcast this recording. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve, and he strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So, Father, we thank you for the reading and the teaching of your word this morning. May we have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Probably, like most of you, some weeks I'll do no counseling, I'll conduct no board meeting, I'll uh, officiate no weddings or funerals, I'll go on no hospital calls. But there is rarely a week that goes by that I won't preach and teach God's word. Preaching and teaching is not an occasional function 
of the pastorate. And it's vitally important that we develop preaching skills. And we need to develop, we need to cultivate a, a, a manner of presenting God's word to God's people in a way that's effective and life-giving week after month after year after decade. And Psalm 29 helps us with that. Because what Psalm 29 does, it describes a weather system that forms and incubates over the Mediterranean, and then it moves inland, and it breaks against the Lebanon coast. And then, driven by the winds, it swerves down into the vast trench of the Jordan Rift Valley, and then it finally wastes itself down in the Kadesh wilderness. That's what Psalm 29 describes, literally, this storm there in those geographical locations. But my thesis for you this morning is that the dynamics of preaching and teaching are analogous to the formation and the venting of a storm. That's what we see here. You'll notice seven times it talks about the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. Now, the voice of the Lord carries many ideas, but actually the first one, that we come up to in Genesis chapter 3 is when the Lord says to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife. The word voice in the Hebrew carries the idea of words that are spoken. In fact, God says to um, Moses in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush, you're going to go to the elders of Israel and they're going to hearken to your voice, to the words that you speak. And listen, you and I who preach and teach the word of God, we are the voice of the Lord. Because if a storm, if a storm, and uh, an impersonal natural force, if it can be the voice of God, if it can carry the voice of God, how much more a man who's filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Word. And so you and I are the voice of the Lord. And God wants to use your voice. God would use the words that you speak to accomplish all of the things that are mentioned here in Psalm 29. Now, in Psalm 29, we see a process of evaporation, condensation, followed by what? Precipitation, first grade science class, right? Now, uh, let's go to our next uh, slide there. Yeah, there we go. In evaporation, that's where you, you, you study for your sermon. You just soak up the word of God. And then it forms into a, a thundercloud in your soul. It condenses. And then when it comes Sunday, Boom, you, you preach your sermon. Sunday is the day of precipitation, along with Thursday, after, uh, Thursday mornings. And whenever the word of God is preached, there's, the, there's the, the giving forth of the storm of the word of God. So I want to present to you uh, from Psalm 29, again, the thesis that the dynamics of preaching and teaching are analogous to the, the formation and the venting of a storm. And we're going to see all of these three processes embedded here in Psalm 29. Now, how do I begin to be the voice of the Lord? How do I begin to be the, the, the man that can speak the word of God? That, that God can thunder himself through. When we're told here in verses 1 and 2, uh, we have preparation. The preparation in verses 1 and 2. A scribe, the scribe just means to give. Give to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. Now we're told there in verse uh, 1, ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. The word mighty is El. El is a short form for Elohim. Uh, before God makes his voice known, the sons of El, the sons of God, are called to worship. And you guys, you know this. And I'm, I'm speaking, I, I see the mixed crowd out there, but I'm a pastor. And I'm, you know, men, we're, we're Calvary. I, I think that the greatest gift, from my perspective, the greatest gift that Pastor Chuck left to Calvary Chapel is a theological conservatism. 
If you can't chapter and verse it, we have no interest in it. We just have no interest in it. In my New American Standard, the last phrase of verse 2, it says, Worship the Lord in holy array. Um, the theological word book of the, New Test- of the Old Testament translates it this way. Prostrate yourself before the Lord when he appears in holiness. I love that. Prostrate yourself. Fall on the ground before God when he appears in holiness. And, and the implication there is God wants to show up. He wants to reveal himself to you. Even before you break open the word, even before you get into the hard work of study, God wants to show you how good and how awesome he is. I had to iron a patch onto a pair of jeans that were fraying a little bit the other day, and it said, before you iron this patch on, get get the jeans hot with the iron. You don't want to apply this, this patch to, to cold jeans, you know, or room temperature jeans. And so I just kept the iron on there for about a minute, moving it back and forth so it wouldn't scorch, and just getting that place that was to receive the patch ready. And then that patch just went on. Listen, guys, all of you who study the Word of God, all of you who prepare to preach and teach and to, 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 to give, your soul, your soul has to be prepared. You just don't get up and go, I'm going to go get a mess. I'm going to go write a sermon. Well, you might write a sermon, and it'll probably um, not be a very good one. (laughs) Because your soul is to be warmed up and heated to receive the the revelation of God, the word of God. And that's what's happening in verses 1 and 2. There's preparation. There's ministry to God before there's ministry to God. Uh, to people. There has to be preparation in worship before there's preparation in study. Um, we can make a whole sermon out of verses one and two, but we got to go on here. In verses, uh, verse three, we begin to study. It says there, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. This begins the process of evaporation because the waters are the word of God. The Lord is over the water. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. You are the voice of the Lord. You're going to speak the words that he's speaking. And where does it begin? It begins over the waters. And even as something is transferred from from the the sea up to the sky, even there's there's that process of going from liquid to vapor, so there's something that, that, that transpires here as I study the word of God. Something here is, is uploaded to the cloud, if you would. It's uploaded into my soul. There's a transfer of something here to here, and it's the evaporation process. We know that a thundercloud forms over the ocean through the process of evaporation, and that's where the liquid is turned to vapor. And even as, again, as water is transferred from the ocean and it forms a cloud, the revelation of God is transferred from the written word of God up into your life and into your soul. Be much over the waters of God's word. Be much over the waters of the word of God. And and something will begin to form inside of you. This is where we soak up word studies, cultural, linguistic, historical, and theological information. Uh, This is the who, what, when, where, why, and how. the scripture. Who said this? Why did they say it? Where did they say it? When did they say it? You know, who did they say it to? How did they receive it? What was the upshot of it? All of these Uh, All of these inductive questions, and this is where you put all of your inductive tools that you learned, you know, in IBS and all of the other things. This is where you put all of these tools to work because these are the tools of the evaporative process. You read the commentaries. You do a devotional study. You do your word studies. This is where all of that takes place, where you read, you study, you meditate, and you pray. And the work of evaporation is hard, hard work. And so some men, some women, to avoid the hard work of evaporation, they're not over the waters of God, but they draw from the wells of men. 
And the Lord's not over the wells. The Lord is over the waters. You know, how easy it is to dip from another man's well. And what happens then is siphoning replaces evaporation. And why are you guys looking at me? You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And, and, and copy and paste replaces study and prayer. Now, you, you need to take a cup full now and then. But the Lord is over the waters. He's not over the wells. Take a cup full, but not a bucket full. Someone has said, if you just quote from one man, that's plagiarism. If you quote from many men, that's well-researched. And so my sermons are well-researched. Your, your sermons are probably well-researched too. But there's this ev evaporation process. And you, you all have your own way uh, of doing it. You have your go-to commentaries, your go-to lexicons, your go-to uh, uh, linguistic, cultural, historical sources, whereby you, you learn the fabric, the background, the context of the text. And this is just, you're just, all of this stuff is just, is just being evaporated. It's being lifted into your mind, and it's being lifted in your soul. It's like this theological, homiletical, hermeneutical vapor, you know. And vapor is really just another name for fog. It's, a, it's up there, and uh, uh, you're going, I'm not sure what to do with this. I got a lot of stuff going on up here, and something's going to shake loose sooner or later, I think. But you're just, you're just getting it. And you're probably making notes uh, on a piece of paper or on your, you know, laptop. And, oh, I think that's interesting. That, I think that's interesting. I'm not sure how that's going to fit but it's a cool thing or a cool saying or a quote or something you heard up here or from another sermon. Um, you know, the name of this game is Bag, Borrow, and Steal, right? And we're always, you guys know, you, were, you always got your ears out. You always got your antenna up going, oh, oh, I can use that. Oh, I can use that. And you've got this catalog of, of, of information that hopefully is at your fingertips. But it's all part of the evaporation Process. Now, the evaporation process is followed by condensation. I'm moving quickly because of my limited time here. The evaporation process is followed by condensation. And I believe that that is, is um, described in verse 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The, the storm has not yet broken upon the Lebanon coast. That's in verse 5. But right now, the, the storm is just forming over the Mediterranean through this evaporation, condensation uh, process. Um, through the evaporation process, uh, the air becomes saturated with vapor until condensation occurs. We're told that a vapor, of, uh, a vapor droplet, it's carried upward by air currents, and it grows by, by condensing then with other uh, water droplets. A water droplet is like 10, I mean, a, a water vapor droplet is like 10 microns in, in diameter. That's 10 millionths of a meter. Um, there's no way, you know, to even, uh, if, you were to, if you were to feel one, you wouldn't feel one water vapor. Uh, it has to condense, it has to join with, hook up with all kinds of other uh, vapors to become a, a rain droplet. But this is taking place. All of this vapor, it, it, it's, it's coming up. And the vapor becomes drops of rain. And then the cloud forms as these, as these vapors condense with one another um, and as they uh, uh, coalesce with one another. Uh, droplets begin to form, and they begin to form together, and cl the clouds then become thicker and darker. Water spends nine days, nine days, fr from the moment that that 10 micron size droplet of vapor is, is extracted from the ocean by the heat of the sun. It spends nine days uh, up in the air, uh, coalescing, condensing with other vapor droplets to form the drops that become the cloud, that become the, the rain. But as they condense together, it becomes the cloud. It spends nine days 
during this incubation process. Now, we don't have that luxury, guys, do we? We don't have nine days to prepare for the next, um, the next message, but that's what's happening up in there. But you and I, because of the saturation with the Word of God, that saturation with the Word of God, it condenses into a burden uh, of the Holy Spirit. And you know what's that, and you know what that's like. You get all this stuff. You, you read your favorite commentaries, your lexicons, your, your dictionaries, your encyclopedias, your background, whatever, whatever you use. And you're reading it. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, I, I think that's important. I'm going to make a note of that. Or that really helps me understand that phrase, that word. Um, but then something happens. And it begins, it begins to come together. A message is formed in you as you brood over, as you pray over, as you study out, as you seek out, as you meditate upon God's word. You don't study, and all of a sudden, boom, there's this huge thundercloud inside of you. It, it forms little by little. This is why, and I don't mean to step on anybody's toes. I, I don't understand. Some guys can do it and they get away with it. They've gone away with their whole lives and they have churches 20 times bigger than mine. So it's not, this isn't a defect. But some guys wait till Saturday morning to start their Sunday morning sermon. I could never, ever, ever do that. Because this evaporation, condensation process of the revelation of God, it takes so long in me. Now, with some of you, you're like, you're like microwave pastors. And they just, just come together so fast. And it's good. It's good. This is not a criticism by any means. But it's just an amazing kind of thing to me that that process can be speeded up. Because that is not my experience at all. I, I have to brood over, think upon, pray through, wait for this, these things to collide and come together in my soul. But a message is formed in you as you brood over and pray through the, the word of God that you're meditating on in the section that you're to preach from. And in, con, in this condensation process, something powerful and something majestic begins to form in your soul. And, and you know what it's like. I've been, at, I've been in some form of ministry since January of 1973. A youth pastor, assistant pastor, or a senior pastor. That's over 50 years now. And I've been at this thing a long, long time. But I'll, I'll, I'll be preparing for Sunday and reading through my passage and, and, and reading and praying and thinking and you know, after a while, I'm going, I, I, I got nothing. I, and almost every week, this, is, this just isn't pastor hyperbole. We're good at that, but this isn't that. Um, almost every week, I despair. I go, oh, man, I, I'm just not getting anything from this. And then all of a sudden, wham, oh, yeah, and then, whoa, and, and these droplets begin to condense together. And then, oh, 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 yeah, that, 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 and writing and, and typing out. And my wife says, what's wrong with you? Don't bother me. I'm condensating. <laughs> Something's coming together. The cloud is coming together. Something majestic, something powerful is beginning to form inside of my soul, <coughs> you know what I mean? And I can, I can feel just in my soul. This isn't even, we're not to the coast yet. The thunder and the lightning. I used to go to the Jack Hayford conferences back in the uh, uh, 80s at Church on the Way. And Jack had John MacArthur there once. And John was talking and he said, someone would ask me, uh, don't you just love to preach? He goes, well, yeah, I love preaching. But even better than preaching is when I'm in my office and this word begins to form. You guys know what I'm talking about. That it comes together and you're just so excited in God and you're just so blessed 
that God is revealing these things to you. That's the condensation process when all of this stuff, it, become, it begins to come together and you begin either in your mind or on your paper, begin to write your sermon and, ooh, this is going to fit here and that's going to fit there and you try to find some kind of a logical, you know, uh, intelligent flow to the thing. But that's the condensation process right there. Ideas are connecting. A life-giving word is forming. And again, you know what it's like. And this message is powerful. The word powerful means the capacity to act, the potency to produce, the ability to cope. This is going to bless the people. It's going to give them some tools to live life through. It's going to give them the ability to act in their situation. It's going to bless them. It's going to help them. It's also a message in verse 4. We're told it's a majestic The word is majestic means what's beautiful and what instills awe. And as this this thundercloud of of sermon forms in your soul, it's thundering and it's lightning and it's powerful and it's majestic within you. And we're always told, hey, listen, if you're not excited about your message, they're not going to be excited out there. You, 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 you have to be moved by it. It has to have the power to move you. It has to have the majesty to instill awe in you. This is why we go back to verses 1 and 2 for worship. You know, give, ascribe to the Lord, give to the Lord glory and honor and strength and power. Warm up your soul before the, the Lord. And so uh, something powerful, something majestic begins to form in you. It touches you. And again, it has to be powerful and majestic in you because if you're not moved, it's not going to move anybody else. Well, in verses 5 through 9, we come to uh, precipitation. Precipitation is the the sermon that's preached. It's the message that's brought to uh, whatever context that you're speaking into. So we soak up the word of God. A burden is formed in us. A storm is formed in us. And then we move inland there to send forth of our burden. So laden with the word of God, moved by the spirit of God, we are a storm of holy passion and righteous truth. So again, the premise is is that the dynamics of preaching and teaching are analogous to the formation and the venting of a storm. And we've seen the evaporation process, the condensation process, and now precipitation. Well, there's different types of precipitation. Uh, The first type that I can mention is mist and drizzle. (laughs) Why are you laughing? (laughs) Uh, and it can feel like a fog. You know the phrase, you know, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there'll be a fog in the pew. And mist and drizzle is minimal precipitation because there's been minimal evaporation and minimal condensation, which means there's been minimal preparation. There's, been, there's not enough time spent before the Lord. There's not enough time spent in the Word of God. You wait till the last minute. Again, I could never break open the Word of God on Saturday morning and hope to have a message. I could have information. I could could have a sermon, but I couldn't have a storm of truth and passion. Uh, That doesn't form in me uh, in one day. Um, What a mist, mist is an aborted cloud, is what that is. It just never made it off the ground. And I wonder, have you ever misted and drizzled on your people? Well, ask your people. (laughs) Uh, It's like, don't be the preacher who says, you know, this week I didn't have enough time to prepare. And then he takes 45 minutes to prove it. You know, don't, don't be the, don't be that guy. Um, Other, other uh, forms of precipitation are snow and sleet and hail. And this isn't a refreshing shower, but it's a cold soaking And through this kind of preacher, God seems impersonal, distant, and foreboding. Snow and sleet and hail is the word of God coming through a cold personality because that personality has not had enough encounter with with the character, the nature, the person of God, which takes us back to verses 1 and 2. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the El. Ascribe, give to the Lord glory and might. Bow before him when he uh, uh, appears in holiness before you. 
Here's a soul that knows God and, and bows at the feet of God. But if here's a, a preacher who doesn't take that time in worship, who really doesn't know God personally, uh, the word of God through him is like snow and sleep and hail. God seems impersonal, distant, and foreboding. Again, it's a personality that has not had enough, a thorough encounter enough with the word of God. Hail is condensation gone crazy. Let's go to our next slide here. Um, that woman just sat through one of your sermons. Um, that, she's an actual victim of a hailstorm, her and her baby there. And... Um, when do you hail on the people? You're not giving enough. You're not serving enough. You're not praying enough. You're not inviting enough people to church. You're not evangelizing enough. So go to Calvary Fremont on October 7th and learn how to evangelize. Uh, you know, all, all of the, we can just beat the people up. And, and you've sat through sermons like that. I've sat through sermons like that. Hopefully, I've not given sermons like that. Now, the people I serve might, might beg to differ with that, but we all know pastors and, and, and sermons that are more of a hailstorm than a refreshing soaking of the Lord. So mist, drizzle, snow, sleet, and hail, they are all turned into refreshing showers through worship. And again, the man of God, the woman of God, has to have that fresh encounter daily with the person of God that keeps your soul humble before the Lord, that the word of God might come through a humble vessel. Well, this thunderstorm has um, um, formed, and then it begins to break upon the Lebanon coast. Verse 5, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the in pieces, the cedars of Lebanon. He makes uh, Syrian. Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. A thunderstorm has various characteristics. First of all, the first characteristic of a thunderstorm is thunder. When the air is crossed by a spark of lightning, it becomes superheated and it rolls into thunder. And I believe there should be thunder in our preaching. I believe at times God calls us to give out thunderous warnings. Now in the Bay Area... Um, Thunder is like this real distant growling of a lion, if you would. It's just this uh, kind of rolling thing. Um, you can tell that it's thunder, but it's quite uh, indistinct. I was at the top of Hell's Canyon once in Idaho, and the thunder there was like a gunshot, a literal gunshot in my ear. When I hear thunder in the... Bay Area uh, gets no rise, gets no rise from me, but I tell you, at the top of Hell's Canyon, I feared that that thing made me shake. That thing made me quake. I made sure I got under my car or something. I just uh, I knew that that storm was out to wipe me out. I think there needs to be thunderous warnings in our preaching, but all thunder, all stern warning, makes for legalism. And we begin to be defined by what we avoid. Now, it's interesting that each uh, peal of thunder, it's, it's accompanied by a flash of lightning. And I do believe that if you warn, you need to give the reason why. There has to be light. There has to be understanding. There has to be some kind of uh, light turned on in the part of your hearers. Another characteristic of thunderstorm is lightning. Uh, now, with lightning, uh, there's a momentary glimpse of far horizons, and your faith is stretched, your desires are stirred, the, the preacher gives you deep insight and wisdom. And, and with lightning, I, I, I can see what I, I didn't know was there. And so, you know, last night Pastor Don was preaching about um, desiring and yearning for the, seeing the glory of God. God, I want to see your glory. And maybe some of you have never had that orientation before. And, and in his preaching and by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you saw something you'd never seen before. You saw a far horizon. You go, man, I, I want that. I see that. I desire that. And that's what lightning does. <coughs> Excuse me. The lightning of revelation in a message. 
You, 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 see, dis, you see things you've never seen before. And, and not just kind of an intellectual thing, your desire is stirred. And you go, I want that for my life. I, I've never really thought of it that way or considered it like that. But that's a value I, I want to download into my life. Now, you didn't possess it right away, even as you can't possess far horizons right away. But it's something that's tucked away in your spirit and something you begin to desire. Um, but all lightning makes for mysticism and emotionalism. Um, one of the dangers of lightning is you can be blinded by the lightning and not enlightened by it. All thunder and lightning, it makes for a dazzled people, but it makes for a parched earth, so there has to be rain. Another characteristic of a thunderstorm is torrential rain. We're told that persistent, moderate rain can drop five inches in 24 hours, but a thunderstorm can do that in 20 minutes. Just think what you can do with 40 minutes in your sermon. <laughs> a thunderstorm, this torrential rain. But I, I found that torrential... Um, uh, torrential instruction alone, it, it leads to, to, to intellectualism. Some clouds dump water without the display of thunder and lightning. And to me, that's just boring. Have you ever sat through a sermon? It's just an info dump. It's just a, this Greek word means that, that Hebrew word means that, and there's this interesting Hebrew culture behind this, and this happened historically, and theologically this means that, and this is what it means theologically, soteriologically, eschatologically, pneumatologically, ecclesiastologically, or whatever. And you're going, what? what? And it's just, it's just boring. There's no thunder, there's no lightning. I, I want thunder, I want lightning, and I want torrential rain. I think that all has to be in there in, in, in our messages. Again, some sermons are just info dumps. Let there be thunder. Let there be lightning. Let there be rain. Probably most of you are familiar with the name Martin Lloyd-Jones, a very stern English preacher. Uh, uh, a man with some very exacting standards when it came to the, uh, the art of preaching. But he said this. Let's get him up there. He said this. I'll forgive a preacher almost anything if he leaves me with a sense of God. Isn't that awesome? And again, stern, demanding. But I'll forgive him almost anything. You know, I'll hear a lot of sermons. I was with my friend a number of years ago in Washington. On a Sunday, we went to his church. And he said, what did you think of the sermon? I said, well, the guy didn't, didn't preach the text. He read the text, then he taught on something else. And my friend got mad at me because uh, I, was, I was, you know, criticizing the preacher. I said, no, what he said was right, but it wasn't the passage. And I think so often I hear messages, I hear the right thing from the wrong passage. You know, he, he re reads the word, and then he teaches he teaches something else. But if he leaves me with a sense of God, that's okay. Uh, he's preaching the truth. He's preaching the word, not just the word that, that he read, but he's preaching the word. But if he can leave me with a sense of God, man, I'll forgive him. Pastors do that with thunder, with lightning, with the torrential rain of God's word. I need to get going here. Some of the results of the thunderstorms are given us here uh, in the rest of the passage. In verse 5, we see the breaking power of preaching. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, the Spirit, through your preaching, is going to lay low the proud and the lofty. In one of the Hebrew forms of this verb, it means the smashing of idols. Through your preaching, you're going to bring men and women face to face with their sin. You might not even be aware of it, but you're bringing them face to face with their sin. And you're breaking the back of that sin. I had a woman come to me one time after preaching. I, I didn't preach anything about marriage, relationships, divorce, nothing when it came to that. And she said, because of what you said today, I'm not going to divorce my, my husband tomorrow. Wow, well, praise the Lord. And I was talking about speaking in tongues or something. I don't know, or tithing or something. I, I don't know what it was. 
But God just flowed to her need. And that word broke the back of her sin. And you know what it's like to sit in preaching and to have God deal with your heart. And you leave the place a different man, a different woman, who's repented of this sin or that son because the Lord has broken the cedars in your own heart. Verse 6, he makes the Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. This is the renewing power of preaching. Huge mountains, the Lebanon range, Syrian. Syrian Syrian is just the Phoenician name for Mount Hermon up there in the northeast of the country. Uh, They skip like young animals. The joy of your youth is removed. The word of God, the voice of God moves the heavyweights. And you might think that there's some men, some women in your church, they'll never change. They're just like professional spiritual jerks, you know, kind of. And and they know everything and nothing penetrates them. God makes the mountain ranges. He makes Mount Hermon skip like a calf. And the heavyweights, the heavyweights are moved by the word of the Lord. The word of God through the man of God renews people's passions for living up for God. The greatest compliment I've ever received in my ministry, a guy came to me after church one Sunday, and he said, when I leave Calvary Fremont, I want to live for Jesus Christ. I thought, wow. He didn't say, Tim, you're a better preacher than Sam. He didn't say that. (laughs) The greatest compliment when I, when I leave your ministry, I want to live for Jesus. And I, I was thinking, what, what could be better than that? Because he was moved. He was moved like Syrian, like Lebanon, and he skipped like a calf out of that place to live for God. In verse 7, we see the revelatory power of preaching. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. Again, we have spiritual insight that fosters vision and strong desire. And the Lord does that through preaching. Probably for a lot of us, the Lord did that again last night, just as we saw horizons of the glory of God. In verse 8 through 9a, we see the generative uh, power of preaching. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve. uh, Excuse me, verse 8. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness... The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve. Now, uh, this is the generative power of preaching. The Kadesh wilderness is dry and barren, but the storm transforms it by shaking it. The word shaking means to writhe in labor. It's used in the book of Job to to have, uh, means to, to writhe in labor pain. It's translated by the New American Standard in the book of Job to bring forth. The word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord brings forth the wilderness. It's it's the streams in the desert. It's this dry place that's made green by the water of God, by the storm that's breaking through your ministry, through your sermon. It's fruitfulness in the desert. Also, it makes the deer to calve. The deer here is pregnant, and the storm sends her into childbirth. I think if I was pregnant which I guess now as a man I could be, if I was pregnant at the top of Hell's Canyon, I I would have given birth right there in Idaho. It's an amazing thing. It was just so powerful. But the whole point is this, is that the storm, it shakes something loose. It shakes something loose. And, And as you preach the word of God, ministry is birthed in the people who listen to you. Seeds are planted, they're watered. And even... Things are brought to birth, even as, pe- even as people listen to you. And there's this thing inside of them that says, I'm going to give myself to that ministry. I- I'm going to volunteer for that ministry. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Or I'm going to go home and serve my husband better. I'm going to go home and serve my wife better. Things, uh, 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 people that are pregnant with, with the things of God, your word shakes it loose. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The storm shakes loose what the Spirit is doing in people when it comes to life and ministry. In verse 9b, we have the searching power of the voice of God, the searching power of preaching. The the voice of the Lord strips the forest bare, and in his temple everything says 
glory. The forests are the wild, untamed places, and they're brought into God's searching gaze. There's no hiding among the trees. You know, Moses was stripped of excuses in Exodus 3 and 4. Job, in the first two chapters, he was stripped of everything, right? Wealth, health, family. He was stripped of everything except his self-righteousness. And he hangs on to that dearly through the rest of the book. He even charges God with fault. I'm right. God is wrong. There are some real heights of faith in there, but most of it is Job clinging to his self-righteousness. And then finally in chapter 42, and what to me, it's one of the most powerful encounters between God and man in the Bible. Job is finally stripped of his self-righteousness. He goes, I lay my hands upon my mouth. Who am I? I've, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and I lay everything down. And finally, he's stripped of his self-righteousness. Your preaching does that in the lives and the hearts of people. We see the searching power of, of uh, the Word of God. We're told there in Hebrews 4.12, let's just go ahead and get the next slide up there. For the word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and stripped, laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So we have all of these results of preaching um, I'm going to take, keep you here for 90 more seconds. In verses 10 through 11, we see the aftermath. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. This is the aftermath. This, this is what people leaving your church should look like. You know, just the flood. And they're saying to one another, now that was a good sermon. You know, they're just washed out, you know, and they go into their week through that. And so may your teaching be a flood that the Lord presides over as the king and caught up in the current of God's love and purpose. May they be swept into their week by the flood of your ministry. And may God use your ministry to strengthen and to bless the people. And so we see in Psalm 29 here, we see preparation and worship, beginning and study, maturing through meditation, delivered in passion, and the aftermath in abundance, the evaporation condensation and the precipitation process. So may God use you in these things. And so I entitled this uh, sermon, The uh, Preparation and Delivery of Sermons. I could have also entitled it, Preaching Up a Storm. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, use, uh, use us, God. Use us, Lord, uh, in this kind of a word, to bring this powerful word in this day, God, that your people might be built up, that they might be blessed, they might, they might be sent forth skipping like heavyweights, Lord, and sent out, Lord, with having things birthed in them through the word of God, stripped bare of their self-righteousness, their sin being broken through the word of God that's preached. We love you, Lord Jesus. And in your name we pray, amen. Okay, amen. Well, wasn't that good? Um, I hope that that helps you to preach up a storm the next time that you're handling God's word. Hope to see you on May 24th and 25th in Pleasanton, California. Also make sure that you're following us on whatever podcast platform that you're using because next week there's going to be a follow-up interview that I did with Tim unpacking some of the concepts and principles of Psalm 29 and then how it applies even more directly to you. So I hope that this episode and our training event in Pleasanton helps you to grow in your personal study and public proclamation of God's word. This podcast is a part of CGN Media, a podcast network that points to Christ. We are supported by listeners like you. To help us create more great shows, visit cgnmedia.org support.